I don't know how to fix all the straights. There's a lot of issues with these straights. I don't Need know. Hang ups. That's the issue. It's just too. It's just too much. Like I can't. That's why I'm more comfortable in queer spaces. I'm like I. I don't have time for this. Lenora Claire, curator extraordinaire, curator diva. Oh, I like that. What's the vision behind this show? It was two women who are already really well established as musicians who are friends who are like, you know what, we want to transition into the art world. So let's all work together, you know, three ladies and, and get this done. So sisters doing it for themselves. That's right, yeah. Hello, and welcome to Here in LA, Hollywood Edition. Today we're talking with Lenora Claire, who if you ever met, or even saw walking down the street, you would never forget her. She's got striking red hair, borderline illegal curves, and high, 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 high heels. And one of the sweetest hearts in town. We're going to talk to her about what it was like growing up in L.A., hanging out in Hollywood, going to punk and industrial clubs, curating art, getting stalked, and basically being fa fabulous. <laughs> Whether she was helping other people uh, through promoting, um, packing their clubs, uh, healing their wounds, or even casting television shows, Lenora is one of a kind. So please let's welcome her. You, your image is voluptuous sex vixen. Sure, thanks. I'll take it. Yeah. I would think Hollywood is the perfect place for you. Well, I'm from here, so I didn't really have a choice. I don't know. I thought you were from New York. No, well, my parents are New Yorkers. I was six months old. I was born at Long Island Jewish Hospital. I, I've been here since I was six months old, so I'm as L.A. as they come. I'm so glad we're having this interview. Yeah. Let's set the record straight. Yeah. Where did you grow up? Yes. Yeah, so, okay, so this is actually, so my father was an ER doc in New York. They got married, like, the summer of Sam, 77. Wow. And he actually, like, worked on some people who came in. So, like, remember how gritty like the just disgusting grittiness of New York night late 70s. Mm -hmm. So I come around in 80 and my dad was like, yeah, we need to get the fuck out of New York. Like this is, I can't do a kid here. Like this is him. not the place. So bizarrely, and I don't, he's dead now, so I can't ask him, but somehow they landed in Woodland Hills. I don't know, which is like, the, which is so funny. And the, well, it's polar opposite from the grittiness of the 70s New York that they had met under like I don't know how anyway I, I think he probably was like I want the farthest away and and where I grew up and like for the first seven years of my life that part was practically Calabasas and it wasn't like Drake was not living there back then it was not <laughs> it was very just suburban a lot of people very low-key quiet and my dad's like this is where I'm gonna be a, a dad and do some kids and we're gonna do that so I was there until se seven years old and my father he had a super rare disease that poor man like suffered so much so even though he was fascinating like he helped pioneer gender reassignment surgeries he was a urologist so in the 70s at slow kettering he like did that and then um he like opened up clinics for prostitutes and sex workers um in mexico yeah he's really amazing he spoke seven languages and then it was fascinating and then when he got too sick to operate himself like around 87 he had this major surgery he was actually clinically dead from five minutes uh they took out 23 feet of intestine so he's like i'm too sick to like operate I'm going to become a psychiatrist because no matter how sick I am, I can sit and help people. And I'm going to specialize in sex therapy because my sort of dual specialty of urology and everything. And then eventually it was um, sex therapy and chem dep. So he became this like big Beverly Hills celebrity 90s. Because think about it, sex and drugs, you you get the good patients. So um, he, <laughs> he, yeah. So like that's another thing I always talk about was really instrumental in my growing up was that, you know, the idea of like fame and celebrity, like I saw it covered in vomit in my father's office it was very real and like he's dead now but like my dad was one of don simpson's doctors if you know about don simpson and i remember like a screaming jerry bruckheimer calling and ruining our thanksgiving like that's i had a very la upbringing very very that um but yeah so my, my dad's story is it's actually really fast well it, it also might be why you're so comfortable with sex and sensuality oh, yeah. and all that oh, yeah. kind of stuff yeah. because your dad didn't have any hang-ups with no. that if you i'll show you in the other room i actually inherited it's an anatomical teaching model of the penis that was called oscar after oscar meyer wiener and i brought it to kindergarten for show and tell and i was like you're your bladder prostate urethra and they're like you're weird kid you can't do that here and like i didn't know right so like i had my, my i have this really funny video of my dad we were, we were filming like a little doc thing on me and I didn't, I didn't even know this, but apparently I started reading really early, like three or four, like fully reading. And the first thing I ever read was a pamphlet in his office. It was a cartoon. And that's why I picked it up. It was called uh, Herpes the Love Bug. And my dad's like, all right, you're reading. That's great. Herpes the Love Bug. Here we go. 
Maybe we should give that to all kids. I know. Well, but yeah, my dad was really proud. He'd always say, like, I knew more about, like, STIs than anybody when I was very small. Was he a good dad when you were uh, a teenager? My dad was the best dad. My my mom, they, they split up, and my, my mother decided she did not want to be a mother anymore. So my father, sorry, my dad was, my dad was like, my best friend. We were so really close. So um, he was the greatest dad. And when it came to dating, like, I remember, oh, my God, I remember in sixth grade, he gave me, do you remember those like gold coin condoms? Do you remember those? Yes. He gave those to me. I thought they were Hanukkah gelt. I'm like in sixth grade. He's like, you're going to need them soon, kid. And I'm like, there's no chocolate inside. Like, what is this? So you grew up in the valley. Yeah. Studio when- City by that point. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So closer to Hollywood. You're, you're creeping yeah, closer. Yeah, yeah, So, okay. So a- after 88, I was in Studio City from 88 on, which people don't know this, but that was actually like, Studio City was like more gay than West Hollywood. We had I did not know that. Yeah, so all the all the best. So like Oil Can Harry's, the Queen Mary, which was actually predated Stonewall, it was this massive drag club on Ventura Boulevard. My parents used to go on dates there. I'd walk past it. That's why like I just love drag. Why would your parents go on dates there? Because it was fabulous. it was really fun. Like I don't know, like a drag club. Like it's the same reason I like a drag club, but they just liked it in eighty nine. You know, like whatever. You you have incredible parents. That's great. Yeah, my my dad was really really something. He was also a police surgeon too. He fully went through the police academy. I can show his badge just behind you, <laughs> and it was really funny because like he was a notorious speeder. He had this like sparkly uh, Laguna Green BMW, and he would like drive all crazy. And then a cop would like pull him over and he'd be like, "Oh, license or whatever." He'd pull out his license, and like the badge would just like flop out. And they'd be like, oh, Dr. Claire, like, oh, sorry. And then he'd like drive away 100 miles. Like that was his thing he did all the time. Did you go to uh, private school in the Val? No, my dad was really adamant about not doing that. I actually went to, it's, so do you remember the show Head of the Class? Sure. It was based on the program. I was in, it was a a program with it. It was Carpenter Avenue, Walter Reed, North Hollywood. My dad actually was uh, instrumental in creating the, North Hollywood version of it for kids with 150 and above IQs. Mm. So I was in like the nerd program at the public school, which like, nobody really had social skills amongst our weird little smart kid group. So I I could be as weird as I wanted to be. And I was like, cool. Like I, I felt fine. I was very protected by the fact we were all kooky weird kids. Mm-hmm. But I was in public school. So it was like this mix of, you know, like some of my friends would get like beat up by kids but like by junior high I I, so goth makeup and chola makeup is like the same so like the cholas and I would ditch PE because back then I wore like the high Doc Martens you couldn't they didn't have zippers back then why were you ditching PE because I had the high Doc Martens that didn't have zippers back in the 90s remember they had the crazy lace up and I didn't want to change my shoes so I would ditch PE with the cholas and would like pluck our eyebrows and black lipstick is black you know so like they actually called me Wera Bruja which is white witch so like, how do you say it? Wera Bruja, which is like slang for wow. white, white girl witch. You know? I love that. Yeah. So I was like hanging out with Chola. How is that not a band name? I know. Someone take it. <laughs> Someone make something good with it. Okay. So you're in high school in yep. public school, which I think yeah, is North the Hollywood. best. Yeah. My dad was like. Because you get everybody. Yep. yep. That's how he But felt. you're still in the smart kids class. That's exactly so it. Yeah. That's also the best of all yeah. the world. Yeah. So were the boys afraid of you? No, I had older boyfriends. I actually, I so funny. I just reconnected. I'll have to send him this. How much older? No, 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 like a couple years. Not, not, not like gross. Like just, you know, like I was like 14, this they were 16. This is a judgment free zone. Yeah, yeah no, no, Le- still legal, still legal. My, I had the same boyfriend from 15 to 18. And so I, but he like, he was like cool. Like we just reconnected. We, so he got mad at me when I broke up with him when I was 18. And he talked to me for like 20 years and now we're friends again. And it's awesome. You see the same kind of guy? He's great. I was no, it's so nice talking to him. Like he's got this adorable daughter, and he's like, she loves Kate Bush like you did, and like it's really cute. It's really nice. You graduated high school in? I was early, so I would have been class of ninety eight, but I was fifteen and a half when I graduated. I had an accelerated. Wow. Yeah, I did not like school. It was not for me, and so because I had a diploma, I realized, oh my god, I could work on camera, and they don't need a tutor for me. So I was, I was probably making better money in ninety dollars than I am now. Because I was just like this golden kid. So I'm in the back of like every crappy TV show, music video, whatever, late with, 90s. With, like I would recognize you? Yeah. Like people, the other day a friend recognized me. I was in a, it's like so embarrassing because he's a monster. But I was like in a Marilyn Manson video, whatever. I, I pop up, I pop up everywhere from late 90s, early 2000s. Like just, yeah, I'm in the back of everything. I guess I should tell my whole like weird path. Uh, my first like grown up job was there was a magazine called Frontiers, which was LA's biggest gay magazine. And 
I was like a 22 year old, like straight identifying girl. And I was always way more comfortable in queer spaces. And I was like, did you have the, the red hair back then? Yeah, too? I have since like late high school. I, I graduated high school at 16. So like that year is when I, I dyed my hair red, which is because I had really big boobs early on. And everybody was like the girl with the boobs. And I was like, fuck all y'all. I'm gonna be the girl with the hair. And so I'd like flip the script. I'd be, it, the hair was actually a combination inspiration from Kate Pearson from B-52s and Grace Jones and Vamp. I was like, that's my look. That is it. What does not it does not get better than that. What year was it in, uh, when you were twenty two? So that would have been two thousand two. Were there any other girls in Hollywood with that look? No, it You're was it. totally different. Yeah, it was a whole different time. That's awesome. It was really different, and I that's mean, who you wanted to be. You wanted to be yourself and stand out. Yeah, I mean, it just it just felt right. Like I was just like, oh, that's it. We're done. Locked in. Like it just I don't know. It just made sense. Just fit, right? So, I, I'm gonna throw you off track. Yeah, go for it. Where do you get your hair done? Oh yeah, okay. So it's my good friend Andrew Marlin, who I'm very, very proud of him. He just came back from doing the hair on the new Matrix movie, and um, for years he he had a salon. It was first called Purple Circle, then Heretic, and now uh, he's, right here in Vermont. Yeah. So I actually picked my old apartment, which I don't live at anymore, um, but I picked it uh, because I would be walking distance from his salon. That was wow. my life plan. Yeah, he's my really good friend of like almost twenty years. I, why, why did I? This is why interviews are great. I would if they would have said name ten, name one place out of ten uh -huh. that you would have gotten your hair done. I would never have thought Los Feliz. Oh yeah, well you know he was the king of like crazy hairdo. Like before anyone else, he did all. He was doing crazy color and extensions like 20 years ago when that, and that literally started going to him 20 years ago he's now at a salon called plaid which is um which he doesn't hector owns it but um he was great and hector did hector won the emmy for the hair on drag race and it's kind of this it's right by world of wonder where they do drag race so it's this cute little drag corner next door is marco marco who makes a lot of clothes for drag race so hollywood boulevard it's off of hollywood boulevard um the yeah. um the um what the, the club with the b um club with the b what's the uh, Bordner's. Bordner's. Right by Bordner's. So yes. Bordner Street, whatever street yeah, that is. Yeah, Cherokee. That's exactly there you right. Go. It's right there. That's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of parties go through our, our so heads. So many parties. We've a lot of and you know, I don't know if you know this, but World of Wonder, where we first met, you know that was the mask. I didn't know underneath that. Underneath it. Underneath it. You used to enter through the side. Yeah. I you never go down knew the that. Graffiti, so it's, it's the mask. Is their basement. World of Wonders basement. So really good vibes in that building too. Legendary. Yeah, yeah. I I had no idea. Yeah. yeah. And I love like the history of punk rock. Yeah. And you hear these names like that one and other clubs. And because they're gone, like even uh, Rodney's English Disco, yeah. you hear about, but you don't really, I can't visualize. Yeah, it was before our time. We're not that old. Because there's it's just, it, yeah. there's no, um, uh, there's no landmark. I know. There should be a sign. There should. There should be a statue. Yeah, and it's so crazy because, like, the mask, which is the basement of World of Wonder, it's, like, where they keep their tapes. It's, like, storage. Oh, but, really? But the, the graffiti and stuff is still there. Like, it's it's pretty cool. I'm here with Lenora, who's the curator for this event. Um, so what, first of all, what made you want to do this exhibition in the first place? Well, about a year ago, I purchased the painting uh, that's now quite famous of B Topless, which is over on that wall by Chris Zimmerman. And I hung it up over my bed. And not to say that everybody is in my bedroom, but everybody that came over would have, you know, a really strong reaction. They, they cracked up, they were repulsed, you know, a, a whole range of emotion. And um, I've said this a million times, but I, I really believe that art's supposed to make you think and feel. And so this piece certainly did that. And since I know so many artists already, I was like, why not, you know, create an entire show based on the theme of erotic interpretations of the Golden Girls? Let's talk about uh, the Golden Gals. Is it Golden Girls or Golden Gals Gone okay, Wild? Okay, so I wanted to call it Golden Girls Gone Wild. And then I got a cease and desist from Joe Francis, of all people, that scumbag. And he was like, I know. And I was like, I should frame this thing. Did he and, own the rights? Well, no, because he had Girls Gone Wild. And oh. so, and I was like, listen, asshole, nobody's going to compare or no, you're going to look at lose profits on your booby flashing DVDs and compare, like, stop. But I was just like, you know, I don't, it's funny, the irony being I'm now married to a copyright lawyer, but this was way back 
when. This is so long ago. And so then I changed it to Golden Gals Gone Wild. That's, okay, good. That's what that was, which is weird because it wasn't Disney or Touchstone who owned Golden Girls who came for me. They right. didn't do anything. It was it was Joe Francis, who was in jail at the time, actually, who sent me the cease and desist. So Today yeah. I learned you can sue people from jail. Of course. Yeah, of course you can. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, lawyers, lawyers still do it now. You did invite me to Golden Gals Gone Wild. Yes, I did. And it was eye-opening to me mm. because I loved all of those people. It was really fun. And I love art, and I yeah. love uh, controversial art. Same. And I love creative art. Yeah. I love my buttons being pushed. Yeah. And what I loved about Golden, Gal- Golden Gals Gone Wild was, first of all, these are older women. Yes. Which is interesting because I think one of them was only like 50 something when they were. Yeah, it was really. I know. As Estelle Getty, it was actually the youngest one who played the oldest, which is like a real head trip. But yeah. And, and But Hollywood yeah. paints them as these are so old, old you know, so grandmas. Old. Yeah. Um, but this is a button that got pushed. Yes. To see the image of an older gray haired woman with her legs spread. Yes. Some of it was graphic, yes. Incredibly graphic. Yes, it was. I love. Yeah. Not because of the salaciousness of it, yeah. but because... Normalized it. Because where else am I going to see that? Where yeah. else am I going to think of that? Yeah. And yet it's right there. Yeah. And it's, it, 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 it makes you laugh a little bit. Yeah. Maybe it's nervous laughter. Yeah. It, but it also reminds you, you're not dead once you past 25 years old no and it's really interesting so like a lot of things converged when i so the the way that it started was i went on ebay i was looking for golden girls dvds and then i saw this artist chris zimmerman and it said nude oil portrait of b arthur and i was like i'm buying this and i put it over my bed and the guy i was dating at the time was like i will not have sex with you here and i was like well if you can't get down with b you can't get down me get out and then i thought about like wow like art makes you think and feel i'm onto something here and then just at the time i was a journalist as i had mentioned at frontiers i interviewed julie newmar who let's see i was at her 75th birthday party it was probably around that time so she was like in her 70s and beautiful just and i was like she's still sexy she still got it why does that freak everybody out and then i just got the idea i was like yeah i'm just gonna you know curate a show and i i talked 40 weirdo art friends into making really incredible art on the theme and a lot of things sort of converged in a really great way it was that uh, all of that art was new all new it was all created for my show wow yeah 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 Hats off, literally. Yeah. Hats off. Yeah, to it was no. Well, it wasn't like people were sitting around painting n- nude gold. It wasn't that. No, I I asked them to do that. Um, <laughs> so what happened was it was at World of Wonder who do Drag Race, and you know they had this like lower level of their building, and I just sort of like convinced them to let me do that there. And it was, but, but that was a decade before Drag Race. Yeah. No. 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 Drag Race. Drag Race came like two years later. Really? Yeah. Is before Drag Race. I'm so out of they, that they scene. Already, they had already done like a lot of documentaries. They did like the movie Party Monster and you know all that stuff. I love they had, that movie. Yeah, that's J- James, my friend who was there. That's James St. James. That's right. Yeah, so that's how that, that's how that all happened. So anyways, um, I loved that show because, maybe because of the, the age thing. Because mm. Hollywood and the quote unquote media does not, I mean, there is a cutoff. It, yeah. For, go back to porn. Once mm. you're 25, you're the mom in the porn. Yeah, my friend Ryan Keeley, she's America's favorite stepmom, and she's younger than me, and she's like the queen of milf porn. A step, like she's a stepmom, and she's like, ah, oh, 30, whatever. What is that? I don't know. That's crazy, right? I don't know. I know it's hilarious. Actually, it was really funny. I had, I, I had, I had a really great experience. It's kind of like really. So I, I do casting now, and I've done it for ten years. It's all you know, reality stuff. And I usually do like the heavy hitting shows. But I had an opportunity. There's a show, Miss Fletcher, on HBO. I don't know if you know it. It's it's really cool. It's um, it's based off a popular book. It's Catherine Hahn, who's like amazing. And it's in in the book. It's like about an early forties woman who gets divorced. She starts discovering her sexuality as her her son, who's college age, is discovering his. But she's discovering it through porn so she like looks up porn and then goes to the real world and tries it out so they hired me because i never do scripted they hired me to cast the fake porns and i put all my friends except ryan, ryan was the only actual porn star the rest were just like my, my friend who does my facials like just whatever and it was so because <laughs> it was so fun it was the fake because they, they just you know the corny dialogue before the action happens that's all it was it was just like clips of that and so i just put all my girlfriends in it and it was like amazing <laughs> That's a really fun job. I would love to do that again. I'm going to watch this then. It's a, it's a, it's a cool show. It's a, and I love it because it's like as her son is, he's dating and she's like 
looking up spanking or whatever. It's really cool. I thought it was a good show. In some ways, I think that Hollywood is great for people like you who want the attention, who like the attention, who feel comfortable with the attention. I like good attention, yes. Right, to an extent. I don't like all attention. I like good attention. But still, if I if I would imagine when you walk down Hollywood Boulevard, Mm -hmm. even you're dressed down right now, which is still fine. Yeah. And um, even if you're dressed down, walking down Hollywood Boulevard, I still imagine you'd have cool sunglasses on. Yeah. And a shiny purse, maybe. Yeah. And some big heels. Maybe. Um, Men are going to say things to you. Yes, they do. Every day. Yeah. Every block. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? I mean, as long as it's not aggressive or rude, like, I mean, a compliment is nice. Like, I, there's definitely guys who are like, cool hair or like, hey, cutie. And I'm like, that's fine. Um, it's when it's aggressive or disgusting. Is honking <laughs> disgusting? It, it's jarring. Don't honk. Still. W- it's jarring. It's still jarring. It's jarring. Like, you must no, have been honked at a hundred times. Yeah, I don't. Because usually a honk accompanies a scream and I'm like, what's next? Like, I don't a like scream? it. scream? Yeah. A You've hon- got men like, screaming. Yes. Look at you. That's not a compliment, though. It's not. A, it doesn't feel. It's. It's just. Ter- you know. You're walking your dog late at night, and it's just like. You know. I, I, the whole <laughs> thing. The too. car. Yeah. The car thing too, because like I've had weird. Like I've had a lot of men expose themselves in cars. Like starting at the age of like 13. Any girl will tell you this. This is not you, 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 yeah, unique to me. Um, so the car thing is also like it's uncomfortable. I also had uh, two men try and grab me and throw me in a van when I was 14, and they got my backpack and I ran away. Yeah. In Studio City. So, which is a nice area. So, right, still is a nice area. Yeah. Maybe nicer today than it was then. Yeah. So I think about that, like what could have happened if they didn't get my backpack and I didn't struggle free. So cars are uncomfortable for me. I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, so Hollywood isn't a perfect place for you, but it's probably better than Kansas City would be. Well, here's the thing. So. I there was a definite allure to Hollywood when I was a kid. Like it's really funny. The other day I watched *Decline of Western Civilization* three. Lots of friends. I remember being at that naked aggression house. I saw a lot of faces. I was texting people that I know. I'm like, I see you in that movie. Number three. It the first one was it's punk. The squatter kids. The next it's one squatter was ki- sw- two is like metal, not my thing. But right. three is they're exactly my age. The kids are exactly my. I know a bunch of them. I texted. He's probably not Nate, my friend Nate. I was like, I see you, Nate, and he's like, Yeah, I know. They're, they were exactly my age, and it was shot in the late 90s, and they were the punk kids that I hung out with. Penelope Spheris? Spheris, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> who's, who's fantastic. Yeah. And all those docs were fantastic yeah. and groundbreaking. Yeah. All, this, all these docs yeah. we see on Netflix are But just... that Hollywood of that era, I was at those shows. I loved it. I loved the greasy, grimy, nonsense screaming. I, what clubs are these, are we talking about? Uh, back in the day, there was the Las Palmas Theater where they had punk shows, which then became Blue, which then became Element. Um, that was where they had like a lot of punk stuff. Um, there was, oh God, what was, there's another theater. <laughs> because remember like in the early nineties, mid nineties when I was a teen, all the eighties punk venues, they were still there. They were just into, like gross, they were just decrepit, but they still existed. So you could still see those eighties bands. They were still alive and playing. I see you as a, a bit classier than your typical punk rock scener girl. Um, I had, I was goth and punk in school. I mean, like, yes, I was the, I, my dad was a doctor in the Valley. So there was that, like the other kids maybe went to a squat and I went back to the Valley, but like, I definitely hung out. Were you drinking places. at these clubs? Oh yeah. Were you smoking? No, it, it's, it's my dad. It's really weird. Um, for all the things that I put <laughs> through, um, he, <coughs> his father had died of lung cancer. And oh. so smoking was like forbidden, but like sex was whatever like my dad would be like you know back when we had orgies like he would just say stuff like that like all the time like whatever um and i definitely had like drug experimentation but i never smoked a cigarette in my life what other clubs are we talking about oh i started okay so back then uh my favorite ones were i still actually can share i still have the membership cards for helter skelter stigmata control factory because you were here by then control factory was the industrial one helter skelter was the goth one stigmata was like goth industrial um, those are my favorite ones that I went to all the time at the probe. My, my issue with industrial, mm-hmm. you can't really dance to it. Oh, but we sure did. We sure did. As if it was Depeche Mode. Like yeah, like it's you. I mean, oh, I I've, I've danced to plenty. Skinny Puppy, Front Two Four, Front Two Four Two was very danceable. I actually am gonna like no. Mm-mm. I'm gonna disagree with you. It's pretty danceable. You're you're educated. It's pretty me. danceable. That's yeah. good. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying we looked cool, but we danced <laughs> to it. I'm sure you looked cool. I don't know about that, but we danced no, no, to no. it. 
the, the I saw the women coming mm. in and out of these clubs. Sure, and yeah. And you looked definitely cool. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, when I drive down um, and pass Rhonda, mm. those kids all look cool. Oh, well, Rhonda kids are super cool because they're from this whole, they're like a whole different thing. They're like cooler than we were. We were like goth weirdos. Like those kids are just like all beautiful. But, but and... you set the table for them. We did. We did. That's true. We, yeah, as, as the elder alts. <laughs> as the 70s yeah. punks did for to- you. Totally. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a kinship and a, yeah, it's a cycle. But I'm just saying now because of. Because, I mean, back then, like, even, like, my husband, like, his mom had to sew his raper pants because you couldn't get them in Kansas City. You know what I mean? Like, and, like, I, this is, like, so embarrassing now, but I was one of the first models for Hot Topic, but I did it because I could get lips, I, like, in the 90s. Yeah. Why is that embarrassing? Because, like, Hot Topic, whatever. But that's how my, so one of my first, so after my teenage boyfriend, then my, like, first real, real boyfriend was Steven Severin from Susie and the Banshees. Wow. He was 25 years older than me, and that's why I went to London. But, like, he saw, because I was, like, goth modeling in 98, and I had a website when, like, nobody did. But, like, Back then, it was really hard. You used to have to go to retail slut to get your stuff, whatever. And like, it was it was really hard to put your look together. You had to really work for it. You got stuff from the back of zines. You had your weird pen pals. Like, so the kids today, they have so much more access to things, so they can look cooler. Because like, we we had to like dye our hair with Kool Aid or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, we had to. But be creative. isn't that more fun when you have to do a little more work? At I mean, it? I can't say because I'm not young and I don't have all the things. I just had what we had back then. I know but, I had a great time. That's all I can say. I had a great messy time. There was a lot of Zima, a lot of good times. It was Zima. just it was just it was it was it was all good times. There were no bad times. Was Melrose your place? Oh yeah, in the nineties. Are you kidding? Wait, so what we would do is we always had some like older brother who would like take us to. Uh, t- we're talking from like ninety three when I was thirteen on, and we would just dr- just drop us off and we would hit. It was like Vinyl Fetish was the record store. You're not in control, totally remember? And then retail slut. You get your clothes, and then you go to Arvarks and then Red Balls and like you would just like do the you know. And come back with all the gear. Who was the woman who first brought Doc Martens to L.A.? Oh, from Nana. Um, right. I, do, I remember the store and I bought them there, but I don't remember her name. Yeah, so the Nana store. Yeah, Nana. Yeah, yeah. Was yeah. that still happening in the mid-90s? Yes, oh, very much. I had purple velvet uh, Doc Martens and like I was the only kid in my school. It was like really exciting. Yeah. Uh, was, why didn't they go there and buy them? Deal. Because they weren't cool enough to know. Like they, You know what I mean? Like I was, I, I don't know. Like You didn't tell them when they asked? Fuck no. <laughs> That's my thing. No. I was like, you know, there were there weren't that many like alt kids, and so we kind of like did our thing. But then everyone was like, "Cool shoes," you know. Were you listening to uh, K Rock? Yeah, of course, everybody was. That was when it was good. Yeah, I went. To, actually, I I was just telling Henry I went to. It was the the Weenie Roast lineup was like insane. It was like. Oingo Boingo, the whole thing. He's like, what? This is all one show? And I was like, yeah, we just win. Like, what? I was like 13 or 14, and the lineup was like insane. I'm sure you were listening to Love Lines. Oh, yeah, of course. I call, I called a bunch as a kid. Yeah. It, real stories? Real problems? No, we made up shit. Like, we had nothing really going on at 13. You're breaking my heart. Sorry. Well, no, I'm sure other people did it for real. Adam Carolla actually went to my high school. He went to North Hollywood. This is why it's breaking my heart. When I first moved here in the 80s. Mm-hmm. And I heard Love Lines for the first time. Mm-hmm. And I was a 17-year-old virgin. Oh, who would be a virgin for many years. Well, it's years. very informative for you. Uh, well, yes. But um, I would hear girls like you call in saying, oh, I'm so, 14, I'm 15, but and blah, we were, blah, blah. We were at slumber parties being stupid. Like, that's what... I didn't know that. Well, I'm sure some of it was real, but like, I thought, we were fake. I thought California girls... Are wild. They're doing all this sex stuff. Well, that is I, true. I'm afraid to even kiss a girl. Oh. And these girls are talking about we had a threesome and we're that both in love with the, we're true. both in love with the guy. What do we do? That was probably true. That was probably true for those girls. I just mean like wouldn't because we did, we only called it like 13, 14, and then we'd be like come up with something funny. Like we like that was like but that's like what you pranking. You know what I mean when you grow up here in that specific era. You know what I mean? Like I remember. Yeah, I remember. So, so huh. here's here's my question. Yeah. Later, you would go on to work with Dr. Drew. Yeah, I worked on Dr. Drew Rehab, yeah. Was that weird? That no, because we I, I worked through the production company. I didn't actually deal with him, so I didn't You never have, met him? No, no, because I was oh. casting. It was really weird because I cast the whole show, but like I didn't have any interaction with him. Interesting. Um, I will say that um, uh, it's really weird to... I have to be careful what I say. I'd actually, we I, we, I did not sign an ND back then, but I will just say, you know, it's really weird. It has nothing to do with him specifically, but like that... I I was better prepared than my colleagues because my father did chem dep 
And, you know, a lot of my colleagues did Jersey Shore. That was a show they had just done because it was our mentor had cast it. And so, I mean, these are all smart young people. But, like, they were not – because, uh, you know, when you do these casting, it's like – it's very comparable in some ways to my dad would do a psych intake. It's an hour long. You tell me your trauma, your drama, especially with drug addicts. It's maybe the first time you've ever revealed anything because you're trying to get help. And so psychologically, I think I was more prepared for these stories. And it was very traumatic for my peers to hear, you know, because look, there's the reason a lot of times people get into drugs and then the bad things they do to pay for their drugs. Mm -hmm. And these are rough stories. So I, I will just say that I'm, that was a long time ago. That was like 10 years ago. And I don't think that they, I think there would be more like training and looking out for the people casting it back then. They're like, oh, you did Jersey Shore? Do this one. Like they just, they flopped you around, you know? Um, By the way, yeah. whoever casted Jersey Shore. Drawn a Fear, my mentor. He's amazing. Totally. And, like, and Jeff. Obviously, Snooki, you're going to have. Uh -huh. But everybody else was also perfect. Oh, yeah. Well, Duran's a legend. Together. They worked together perfectly also. Duran's a legend. Duran, Duran was my mentor. Duran actually saw an article about me, called me in to be on an MTV show. They were really into me until they found out I was 30. And then they didn't use me. And me? then and then he was like, you're weird. Wait, you see a class in a circus. You were a journalist. You, uh, I'm going to hire you. And I was like, cool. So that's how I actually got into casting. What tips do you have for people who come to Hollywood? Mm -hmm. Because that Guns N' Roses video, Welcome right. to the Jungle, yeah. where Axel comes out of the <laughs> yeah. Greyhound bus yeah, yeah, looking yeah. around. Yeah. We know that really happens. It really does happen. Dudes from Indiana come yeah. here. Uh -huh. Skinny. Uh-huh. Super naive. Yeah. Bad things happen to Bad these things people. happen. Um, and it's rare that they just have this perfect life. That, yes. That they get the job. That yes. they get the first couple auditions. Or yep. even yep. the tenth audition. It usually takes a lot more than that, right? Totally. And, um, and the same with bands. The first bands that you hook up with are rarely the bands that you're yeah. with even a year in. So for all these people who are going to come to Hollywood mm -hmm. to let's let's speak especially to women uh -huh. who come to Hollywood who want to be actresses and let's say their first step is in reality. Yeah, because that's what I cast. So that's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. What tips do you have for them? Well, first, you don't have to come here because I do my Skype. So stay in the safety of your your small, safe home and environment you until, don't want to stay in Kansas well, City I'm just saying but I, you actually do because if you're LA and polished and whatever I don't want you I want that like authentic like I'm looking for the people who aren't trying to be on TV I'm looking for the little superstar in their hometown that's just so unaware of how cute or weird or quirky they are so actually stay home and do you have an, do you have an yeah. example of this golden child well no okay so Is like Snooki really that person well, Snooki was that person when they found her. Like the story, draw. I mean, it's drawn story to tell. But like when they found her, she like supposedly turned in her application when there was a self tanner handprint on it, and then she did like a cartwheel with no panties. Like, and then yeah, it was. Yeah. Do you also have to be kind of a lush and a drunk to uh... for a certain type of show, but not all the shows. Like for me, I, I I've also told kids like you're too nice, go home. Like I've had that conversation. Like this is not for you. Um, there's certain shows that are really great and there's other ones where I'm like, you will get ripped apart in that house. Please do not do this. Um, but I definitely would say for me, what I the kind of shows that I get hired to cast, I want authenticity. I do not like, now that everybody has a lighting setup and they're polished and the same, it's like, it's just so boring and rehearsed that, hey guys, that like thing that they all do, like I don't want you. Like I want the person who doesn't know they're interesting or quirky or, you know. I, I, I want the person who's just, you know, like for example, whatever show, whatever theme I'm doing, right? I like when I, I, I cast this one show out of New Orleans, like I was actually casting from the strip clubs in New Orleans. Like they didn't know why I was there. Like I was looking for a certain type of girl. And so I would say if you want to do reality, if you, you for, the only thing I'll say is you do have to be very open. Reality is not a place for people who are shy or guarded. So just like make sure that's right for you. Um, and then when you do it, like just be, the best advice besides being authentic is we love archetypes, right? Like we love like Duran would always say it's a breakfast club. Like which breakfast club character are you? Like we like people that are so that, you know, it's like if you're the sorority girl, I want you to be so that, you know, like whatever that is. Or I'll tell you this, when people, when you're interviewing them, they never know what makes them interesting or cool. Or It's like it's always between and it's always me having to be like, you know, the journalist back and pushing and asking the right questions. And that's where the real truth and the real beauty comes because people don't know what makes them funny or smart or cool. They just never do. They just tell you a bunch of bullshit and then you'll be talking you'll, and like by the end, you'll, they'll reveal like, oh, they were raised in a cult and they never thought to mention you that. And then you're like, no, like, let's let's explore that, you know. 
Should these yeah. uh, people get agents and headshots? Before we don't they- want that for reality. That's you know, that's, you're, that's a red flag. Yep, because look, if you're doing reality, you only make money in reality if your show's a hit season two and three when you negotiate. Season one, you're getting paid shit. So if you're coming in with that kind of attitude, we already don't want you. Like that's We don't want you. Should you buy Instagram followers so that you look more popular than you are unfortunately one thing i really can't stand is that a lot of production companies when i'm casting are like make sure they have a following and then the people with the biggest following are most boring corn and they don't hold up so yes there's a trend where they look for that but i like the people i love are rarely the people that have exploded in that way because that's such a fake canned reality it's so rehearsed and like it's like we saw that with vine stars none of those kids broke out because like oh you can do the short clink well you have no you're not really a creator you know so i mean i guess if you want the attention i uh, it's not for me, but you have to you have to be interesting, or I'm not pushing you through. What if uh, you do get an agent? You come to mm-hmm. Hollywood, you do get an agent, and this person is like, you got to get plastic surgery, you got to get. I would question this, if that, they're the that, right whatever. agent for you. I mean, it's your agent should just love you. Who well, the who agent shouldn't like. take you if they're not gonna go for you. You know, it's kind of like dating. You know, it's like. Go for the person that you really like because you're not going to change. If they're, they're trying to change you, I mean, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes they might say like, "Hey, you know, you might look a little bit younger if you cut your hair or whatever." Like those things. Like I'm not opposed to that, but if we're talking like surgical permanent changes, then find the person who's going to like, you know, be your ride or die the way that you are. Now, there's there's some people where they're okay with that and they want it so bad that they just they then you do that. But I just mean that like. I see plenty of people because I have friends who are on the scripted side of casting, you know, um, and it's like maybe you're not meant to be the sex pot. Maybe you're meant to play the mom, you know, and that's cool. Like that's that's OK. There's a place for you. So even in reality, mm-hmm. is it helpful to take acting classes? No. What about improv? I mean, sure. But like, again, we, we don't want actors. We don't want that corniness. It's like it's. But, but I mean, you know this. Yeah. A woman is just not going to wake up and be like, fuck yeah, take me, Hollywood. Everyone feels like they have to do something. But but I, I see, I disagree. I think all these kids want to be famous now and feel it's owed to them and they feel that they've been ready for stardom because I, I tell you, these kids, they're like really, because I cast True Life for years and that's like the 18 to 25 demo and they'd be in like the cornfields of Nebraska and then you get on the Skype and they've got a whole lighting set up. Their makeup is like so stellar, like in a way that you're like, what the hell? And they're so polished and they're ready to go because then they're talking about their brand and you're like, what the fuck? You're 18 years old. You know, so I think these kids, they grew up feeling that they all were entitled to fame and that this was the best outlet for whatever their projects are and their brand. So I don't, it used to be that you used to have to like find somebody and convince them. And now they're like, they're already telling you like, they're like, well, Cardi B did, you know, this thing. And then she did that. And then the record came out. And then I'm just going to like follow that format. And you're like, okay, okay, Nebraska, you know, like it's. Which True Lives did you do? I did a ton. I worked on it for years. Did you do the one where the, the people were eating uh, their pillows? Well, I, weirdly, I did cast My Strange Addiction, which was a different show where yeah. I did cast that. No, the, the true life that I did. Well, hold on, hold on. You did that one. Yeah, I cast that show. I cast How one season. How do you find somebody who eats their pillow? Yeah, so there used to be, it's not around anymore, but there used to be this website where people would like make confessions and I used to go through it. And Well, there's a, it's called PICA. It's a disorder where they like are compelled to eat weird things. So really you'd like look on PICA forums and you'd find like the weirdest one. I don't want to. Yeah, I'm, I mean, ask me how. I told you how. Like, there's, no, there's, you, there's, 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 I, there's disorders. Just, there's disorders, and then you kind of like your poops have to be crazy after you eat that. Yeah. Did you love working for True Life? And because uh, I love those shows. Yeah. Well, I got to produce on True Life because what happened was the, the the young people kind of grew really attached to me because when you cast, you find them, you package them, you hand them off, and then it's like, bye. Hope they hope they take care of you. Once the filming starts, I have nothing to do with it. And then what would happen is these like young vulnerable kids would be like, "Where's Lenora? I'm on set and I'm scared." And so then they made me producer, and that was really cool. Would you recommend the Axl Rose coming off the Greyhound bus uh-huh. live in Hollywood, their first year, let's say? If they want to be, if they want to be in the industry, should they live in Hollywood? Um, a lot of well, post COVID, it's changed. A lot of auditions are self tape. It's actually changed. Do we think it's going to stay changed? People are really liking it, <laughs> especially because cast people don't have to run office space, and it, it's kind of like this was a real push. I think the industry. It, I think. I mean, there's still going to be some in person stuff, but I do think the self tape is really going to change it. Yes, I absolutely would hurt people with no qualms and no apologies. I could kill people with my bare hands. Are you kidding me? Or I'm an extremely fucking dangerous person. You know, I'm Jesus Christ. I'm a god and I have real divine powers. And yes, I will fucking take the law into my own hands 
Does Lenora Claire have a reason to be afraid of you? You're damn right I'm a scary fucking person. I terrify the fucking shit out of people. Yeah, a lot of restraining orders are not legal, though. It is, it is morally justified and legal to break that law. Lenora Claire wants you to stop sending her stuff. Right. She's part of the Zionist networks, and they got all these girls that have me fucking framed out to be crazy when I'm really the Messiah. People need to learn that I don't have a lot of respect for fear. Lenora Claire's story is, is basically all lies. You will die! I will not stop sending emails to Lenora Claire. I will kill you! I will destroy you! I went to your Wikipedia yesterday. Okay. Have you been there? Uh, not recently. I know that people write what they want. Um, no, I, don't I think, think it's, it's. I think it's fine. Okay, it hasn't been updated that recently from yeah. what I saw, so no, I, I don't think, know what's on there now. I think it's fine. Um, the biggest part is obviously your stalker. Yeah. And in it, they say that uh, the stalker also stalked Ivanka Trump. That's correct, yeah. And in this Wikipedia, it said that you tried to reach out to Ivanka. Yes. And she would not reach back. Multiple times, correct. Why do you think she was like that? Because I don't think she cares. Because I think she is, you know, at the time, Secret Service. Or Actually, I, I reached out to her through her PR and her reps before her father. Was, I, right. still, I still cringe when I say it. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't, I don't think she cares. That time is over. Yeah, that time is over. Somehow we're, we survived. We're, shake we're it all off, survivors yeah. of Ooh. that. Um... She didn't care about stalkers? I don't think she cares now. Because she feels protected? She's protected. She doesn't give a shit about anyone else. She doesn't care if I die. I would think that it's naive to think that you're ever truly safe. Or am I being now callous and I, I, I think cynical? she's in such a position where she, whatever it is, she, I can't speak for her. I just know that there were many, I even, there was even, was it the New York Daily News that did an article with me where the headline was like, you sh you know, this one wants to speak to you. Like, it's out there. She knows. Also, I, I had a mutual, uh, I don't want to get this person involved, who um, texted her when I was in the presence, and she was like, I know she is. She, hmm. I don't know. So I, I can't speak for her. I don't Do know. Do you think that women should be as blasé about stalkers as she seems to be about this one? Obviously not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't know. No. I mean, no. So no, no matter who you are, no matter who your daddy is, you should take it seriously, right? celebrities have been murdered and people with more access and resource than no i mean i i can't i again i can't speak for the actions of of her or anyone in that family well, your advice for other uh wealthy women or people whose well, dads are famous well, what i want to pull back a little bit and just say like cdc stat wise says it's 7.5 million americans who are stocked it's far more than that and yeah it's very high you what do just, you think the number is it's it's considerably higher, and also we're also not accounting for all the homicides where there is stock. Like Nicole Brown Simpson, we identify her as a homicide victim. We don't talk about the fact she was stalked. That's never you don't charge the additional stalking charge. So right, but in in, in that since it, that instance was stalking because he went to her house repeatedly. Yeah, he talked about it. OJ looks right into the camera and talks about how he would watch her through the blinds having sex with people. Like he stalked her. Mm -hmm. um, so you know there's especially like a lot of people of color don't report that's a whole other conversation which i've been having with a lot of people so we're just gonna go off the stats which are 7.5 it's far higher we don't know what the actual stats are I think it's 10 you think it's 15 um i don't want to assign a number i'll just say it's higher i consider you the expert yeah and, and that's why that's why like I, I i know i know enough from working people who run like major studies that i'm not going to quote number i'll just say it's higher. It's considerably higher. We'll, we'll work with that. But the, the, the stat I want to give is that I'm the anomaly. I'm in the 3 to 4% where it's a, a stranger stalker. That means it's 97% usually intimate partner who those people are far more risk. It's far more intimate. And that's why I always say I have to be twice as loud because like it's like you're a woman. It's your ex-husband. You have children together. Whole different experience. Whereas I'm emotionally divorced and I'm just like a mentally unwell man saw me in a magazine and wanted to rape, kill and kidnap me for a decade. Like it's very different. And what's interesting about him, he seems truly mental. He's schizoaffective. That's his diagnosis. But, but like, I'm just a schmo from Illinois. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything. Sure. And also, I feel like I give people way more of a benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. But that guy's crazy. Very, yeah. Like, th there's no question about no, it. No, diagnosed repeat times. And, yeah. and he's escaped um he, incarceration yeah, he, well it was he well no he do you mean when he escaped the mental institution or do you mean i i've had him incarcerated do you mean that i don't I, when i when i read that he escaped I, it was a mental institution so but still isn't that incarceration 
Right, but I've also put him in jail. So that's why I'm trying to differentiate between psych ward and jail, because I put him in both. He wasn't supposed to leave, and he left. He was not supposed to leave the psych ward. That's correct. What happened was we were filming my 48 Hours. They interviewed him without telling me. Oh, wow. And that's why, I don't know if you saw, I posted recently I did see yeah, that. the footage. Because for years, people were like, oh, that girl just wants attention, forgetting the fact that I could be on TV at any point if I wanted. <laughs> um, I don't want this kind of attention. And um, so... Aaron Moriarty from 48 Hours interviews him and you see him losing his mind. You see him being violent. You see him being scary. It was then that people finally believed me, even though I had been getting rape and death threats that are so explicit and horrifying for many, many years. Why do you think people don't believe women? How many hours do you have? I mean, <laughs> re like really? What, what do you think the root of it is? Is it sexism or is it that they just don't want to believe that this evil exists out there? All of it. I think I think people don't want to hold a mirror to the reality of what's going on and their potential participation. And, you know, it's like it starts early on. If you're on the schoolyard and you're a guy and you let other guys act shitty to women, well, guess what? It escalates into something else. And when they get older, they want to obtain and possess that woman you see what i mean so it's like maybe people don't want to take that responsibility maybe they don't realize that culturally even like we'll take the internet we're telling people be famous put yourself out there and we're not doing anything to protect them like so it, there's so many levels of societal issues or we could talk about how the laws don't protect people how law enforcement doesn't enforce so but we, like, there's so many issues all rolled into one you know i mean yes and also i have to also say it's it's not just women that this crime happens to i, I see a lot of men as well but, you know, just like with sexual assault, they don't like to come forward with this. It's very shameful for them. Um, so getting back to the stats, you know, it's it's really kind of chart going into um, silent epidemic territory. And it's I really feel it's stalking is sort of where sexual assault was in the 70s and that there's like a lack of understanding. And part of that being is that I'm atypical for someone who's stalked. Right. Usually it's like I said, just give the example of the mother with the kids nice lady at the bank. Right. The last thing she wants is more attention when this is happening to her. So the only stories that you're hearing are the celebrity stories, which you don't identify with. You're like, Kim Kardashian lives in a gated community. She's fine, girl. She's fine. And you don't think about the crime, but you don't realize who's really getting murdered. You don't realize who's really being tortured. You don't really realize who's at risk, right? And so that's why I was already a person in the media. My story, whether I wanted privacy or not, was never afforded to me because of the celebrities involved. Because outlets like TMZ, they go through court documents. They see the celebrities attached. And I was on Daily Mail without my consent. They just do this. So I'm like, okay, my story is out there I'm gonna have a platform plus I'm the kind of person I have I have solutions you know I'm currently on the district attorney's crime victims advisory board I'm advising for all the gender-based crimes in the city of LA I've been advocating like my stalker currently wears an ankle monitor I want to create an app given to victims and it would use geofencing and it's not like a thing where ACLU is gonna be on my ass I'm not trying to monitor them all the time but if the restraining order is 3,000 feet then ding 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 I want to know when you're in proximity giving me warning and that that's not available right now no i'm the person who created it i'm trying to make it happen no one else is thinking who's, who's against this well that's the thing i'm propo i just proposed it to the da i just did um i have a meeting again with congressman Schiff next week i'm trying to create a stocking task force i'm trying to get money from doj or whoever will give it to me and what i want to do is okay, this is the basic plan so with my partner jess gilbert we've created the innovative justice alliance and innovative justice alliance is to use technology and innovation to like basically it's for people who exist the way that we do who are progressive you know which is a really weird place to be as a crime survivor right now because everything's so polarizing and black and white i don't know why people are like lock everyone up or let everyone out i don't know why that's the thing but whatever and i, I we always joke because neither one of us we're not centrist we're not moderate yet here we are somehow existing within the gray and what that means for me specifically is that, you know, I feel like, you know, drug offenses, let them out. Sex workers, let them out. However, if you're a threat to the community, you are a rapist, you are a stalker, your ass needs to be in. So anyway, we created Innovative Justice Alliance. And the plan that we have for the stalking task force, essentially what would happen, and it doesn't cost that much money either. It really doesn't. So say you're being stalked. The way that what happens now is the cops are like the gatekeepers and they're not trained for this specific area. They don't know. OK, so you go in and you say, like with me, I came in with my mountain of very explicit de death and rape threats. And he was already stalking Ivanka. He tried to kill himself in Ivanka's store. I bring all this information to them and they're like, dye your hair, get off the Internet. That was their advice to me. 
The police. Yes, and that's why I started going on TV and I was like, oh, hell no, we're, like, we're not doing these things. So anyway, so with the stalking task force, what would happen is you would have forensic psychologists who are trained who would look over your evidence and then they would say, they would evaluate you. They'd go, okay, you're red flagged. This is, you're in danger. So once your risk is elevated, if you're in that, because sometimes these things are shit talk, right? Sometimes they're just bad relationships, they're going to blow out. But you know what? Cops aren't trying to tell you that. You need actual professionals who understand this. They 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 need that. So... Then let's say that your assessment happened and you're red flag and they go, okay, you're in danger. You know, this is escalating. We see all your evidence. Okay. Then a care team would be dispatched to your home and then security walkthroughs would happen. You know, they'd work with like, you know, potentially because like people don't realize that every state has the victim compensation board. So say, for example, um, you're assaulted in your home, right? Did you know you get to $5,000 of free therapy in California, $2,000 to relocate? You can also get burglar alarms. They don't tell you this. It's a thing. That's it's awesome. Cal VCB, right? So what would happen is a care team would go to your home. They would do a walkthrough and be like, okay, trim these bushes. You need an alarm there, whatever. They do. And then you'd have a tech expert come in because a lot of the stalking involves your tech. So then we'd go through and go, okay, girl, you clicked on that Sephora ad. They're now on the GPS in your phone. Or let's pull this tracker off your car, right? And so... These are social services which will save lives, and I'm telling you, it's not that expensive, and that's what we're trying to get the money for right now. So I'm always like, I got solves. Like I really, I'm like, just you just need to give me this opportunity. So, do you want to do this full time? It's not that. It, it's do you like, want to be paid for this? Yeah, but when it once it's ha- okay. So the only way that I can get through it because mine is still ongoing is I have to look at the world and go, this wasn't for nothing. I have, it, it cannot, like, I have to make it better for other people. So until, so like right now I'm working on a documentary. I had a deal with Vice way back when, but whatever, Vice is a mess. So I'm working on the documentary and the hope is that the documentary comes out to get the funding for these things, also legislation. Um, I'm right now working on trying to do restraining order registry because that would be really preventative. And the thing is, you could see if people have restraining orders, people don't know how to look before they go on the date. So if I can make it easily accessible to you. Oh. Right, I have so, great ideas. So there'd be an app kind of. It could be an app, yeah. I'm actually I'm um, involved right now with getting an app at the DA's office so that you could track the progress of your crime instead of being in the dark and get whatever help you need. So I'm working on that too. So your your BFF Adam Schiff, Representative Schiff, He's the best. He's the coolest. Um, he covers the Valley and parts of Hollywood. Mm-hmm. Um, why does he care about this? Because of you? Did you make him care? About stalking specifically? Yeah. Uh, well, okay, to his credit, besides the fact he's like an incredible individual, he, before I had anything to do with him, he created um, a grant which got the first uh, rape test kit facility in Glendale. So he already is just an amazing person. And yes, to my knowledge, you know, it was originally Polly Perrette and I, my friend, the actress, we were the first, she was friends with him, and so that's how... What show was she on? NCIS. That that's That was right. her big show, yeah. So I actually knew her 20 years ago back when I thought it, we, we were we were cut out of the movie Coyote Ugly. That's where I first met her 20 years was, ago. In, in real life, is she like you, this um, kind of punk rockish gothic girl? Because she pl- plays that in the show. Well, she, I mean, she, ha- she had a band called Low Ball like in the 90s and 2000s. She's really like an Alabama girl. She's like really, she's from Alabama. And like when she likes a, like, a, like a beer and a cigarette and like a bad tattoo and she's really sweet and like it's like jean shorts e- well like, she doesn't wear shorts but jeans but she's like she's really like she's not like for a famous person she's not a famous person like I, I when we did 48 hours I was the one with the hair and makeup crew and she did her own <laughs> like that's very that's very her yeah yeah okay so you guys together are working on this with with Adam Schiff well yeah we, we, we you know she she has a lot going on with her life so that's who introduced me to Adam Schiff way back see. when um, and so yeah so I just kind of keep running you know Yes. So, and he's open to you. He wants to do this. I'm meeting with him next week. So, because we had met, it's really weird. Like every time we would meet, something would happen. You know, like we'd have this great meeting, and then Trump would happen. You know, or <laughs> like we had the last time we met was like literally the week before COVID, and then COVID happened, and it was like so we like have all these great ideas, and then it's like the world falls apart. I would love to hear that answering machine message. I'm sorry. I have to impeach the president today. Yeah, like it was, I was like, I wasn't, he wasn't ghosting me. I knew where he was. Like it was, it was, you know, it was the kind of thing where I was like, I think the world needs you more right now than I do. So I'll call you in a minute, you know, like it was, it was fine. So we're reconnecting and bringing this back up with the stocking task force. And, you know, because right now Biden Harris have announced they want to, you know, they want to end the violence against women. They're, they're creating something, but we don't know what that something is. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's a whole thing that they've put out, but they've been a little vague. So I'm like, okay. I would like to, this is my, here we go. So we're hope, hopefully going to connect with that. So. And is that the game plan that, that Representative Schiff introduces hopefully. you to that task force? I mean, force? that's what I'm bringing up, bringing up on next week. I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know what he thinks about it. He hasn't heard yet, but that's what I'm bringing to him. I have a, a niece who is going to college. Okay. 
And I tell her, only drink out of bottles. Don't have a red pasta cup anywhere. Because they can, I mean. Smart advice, yeah. What tips do you have for girls at Hollywood parties like that? What should you do and not do? Uh, never go alone. Always, always have your bestie with you because you just, you need somebody look, you just, I'm sorry, but you do. Even if you're the toughest, tough girl, like it's just not advisable always. And believe me, no one's going to say no to bringing another cute girlfriend with you. So just always, always do that. Let's say she meets, um, some Hollywood star Mm -hmm. and he wants to take her home. Mm Mm-hmm. No, no judgment if that's what you want to do, but there's a series of risk minimization techniques you should do if you're going to do that. Like, no, really, if you if you're if you're going to do like you, you know, definitely, again, you know, make sure people someone trusting knows where you're going, you know, all that. This is stuff that your parents. Have so maybe find do. my iPhone with your best friend. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, also, like one of the things also that I have, that I, I have a relationship with them, so I'm not like shilling them, but. I would do it even if I didn't. There's, I don't know if you see where there's like a bangle bracelet on my thing. And what that is, it's flare. And what it does is you push the button and depending on wh- how you have it set up, it could send your GPS coordinates to five trusted people or call 911. What's and it like, called? It's called flare. They're like about a hundred bucks. F-L-A- F-L-A-R-E, the website's get flare. And I That's highly, awesome. yeah, it just looks like a bracelet because a lot of times if you're in a bad situation, an abuser will take your phone away from you. So it's advisable to have a bracelet like that because and it doesn't have to be flair. There's other companies that make comparable things. This is genius. Yeah. So I, I really think that any young woman out in the world should have something like that. There's there's pendants. There's there's things, you know, a lot of communities don't, are not comfortable calling 911. And I get that. So you have community based help. Right. So you got your five trusted people, you know, you push that button and they go, oh, shit, Tony's in trouble. You know, and then they get your coordinates. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm going to put a link in the, the blog yeah. for this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. This is fun. Please give a hello yeah. to a Congressman Schiff for us. I will. He's the best. <laughs> He's All so right. cool. I hope you liked this episode of Here in L.A., Hollywood Edition. Today's episode was written and produced by myself and Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, music by Jordan Katz. And songs by Jordan Katz and Orgone. Feel free to spread the word about this podcast so that we can truly meet our goal and travel through every neighborhood of L.A. talking to cool people like Lenora whose stories should be told. Thank you!